I wasn't there. My little dog was not doing well with the fireworks. <laughs> we didn't have you're, you're, you're now live. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our city council meeting. Today is Tuesday, July 6, 2021. It's approximately 101 p.m. Before we have our Pledge of Allegiance, I'm gonna ask you to please rise for a brief moment of silence as we reflect back on the brave men and women of the United States Armed Forces as they protect our interests around the globe, as well as the courageous men and women of the Las Cruces Police Department and the Las Cruces Fire Department as they keep our city safe 24-7, 365. Councillor Abeta Stuvi, will you join me in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now we're going to have our pet of the week, and I believe Mandy's going to be presenting. Is that right, Mandy? Yes, thank you, Mayor. This is Mandy Gus with the communications office. And let me see if my screen came up there. And so I'm covering for our friends at the Animal Services Center. And today, I'll start with the cat of the week. Popcorn is 11 months old. Um, he comes across as a little bit shy and aloof at first, but once comfortable, he's happy to be a companion for life. He loves playing with all sorts of toys. The more, the better. And then we have our dog of the week, and she is a five-year-old female. Her name is Karina. She's been at the shelter for a while. She loves all the humans she met. She has met so far and rolls over for belly rubs, but she can be a little picky with dog friends, so meet and greets are a must before someone can take her home. And so that is our pet of the week. Okay, thanks. And now we're going to go to jobs of the week, and let's see, I don't know if it's Darlene or Cindy. Good afternoon, Mayor. This is Cindy Quillen. Okay, Cindy. Good afternoon, everyone. These are our jobs of the week. Our first position that we have is a disbursement supervisor. This position is through the City of Las Cruces and it closes on July the 20th of 2021. Next, we have an EMT intermediate position available through American Medical Response. They do have a $5,000 sign-on bonus. This position closes September the 25th of 2021. We also have a driver transporter position through Adelante Development Center. This position closes on July the 28th, 2021. They're also looking for a clerical position through the CSEP Goodwill Program. This is the Senior Community Service Employment Program. It is for participants who are 55 and older. Uh, this position will be closing on July the 28th, and we also uh, have a baby attendant position through Discovery Child Development, and this position closes on July the 29th. This week, we have Mesilla Valley Regional Dispatch Authority. They are having a virtual recruitment event this coming Wednesday, tomorrow, July the 7th, 2021, at 10 a.m. Um, to find out how you can register for the event and how you can apply for these positions or a full list of the jobs that we have, internships and volunteer opportunities, you can visit us at www.employnm.com and at www.governmentjobs.com slash career slash Las Cruces. For our local New Mexico Workforce uh, Connections office here in Las Cruces, we are located at 226 South Alameda Boulevard, and our phone number is 575-524-6250. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful week. Hey, thank you, Cindy. Okay, now we're going to go to COVID-19 update, and Assistant Manager Eric Enriquez will present. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Eric Enriquez, Assistant City Manager, uh, providing the COVID-19 uh, update. So as of this morning, um, fully vaccinated in Doniana County has been about 65%, uh, approximately 75% of those in Doniana County have received the single dosage. And as we all know, effective July 1, all the pandemic uh, related occupancy restrictions um, have been lifted. 
and all businesses across the state can once again operate at 100% of the maximum capacity. Uh, all limitations to mass gatherings are gone, as was evident this past weekend. Uh, businesses, large events, they can operate at 100% maximum capacity, whether indoor or outdoor. Uh, the COVID-19 Unified Area Command, that's a combination of Doniana County and City of Las Cruces at the Office of Emergency, has ceased operations with uh, all the pandemic restrictions that have been lifted. Of course, uh, the New Mexico DOH and OEM and the City of Las Cruces will continue to work together. Uh, FEMA team will continue with Las Cruces Public Schools. Uh, they're, they're starting round two at... Uh, at uh, Oñate High School, Oregon Mountain High School this week, and uh, Doñana Community College Center. Even Doñana Community College Center is hard for me. You know, I, I refer to it as a branch every now and then. So that one's going to take some time, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, Casa de Peregrinos is still uh, hosting uh, on Wednesdays with Amador Health Center for vaccinations as well there. And the vaccine task force will still continue with monthly meetings. Uh, this was a great uh, collaboration team. Thank you again, Mayor, uh, for, for having this available. And a uh, special thanks to the counselors and Counselor Stubbe for sharing the, the task force. And we will continue as school starts. And uh, once that wraps up, then how we can work with the public schools and NMSU on getting uh, students vaccinated as well. Also, the asylum refugees remains the same. They're really at 25% capacity is what we heard from uh, the Annunciation House in El Paso. So things are looking good there. And this will be the last COVID update uh, that I'll be giving on a weekly basis uh, with everything that's opened up. Again, thanks to all the great work in the community and the city of Las Cruces, working with uh, Department of Health and OEM. So. Uh, it's great to see everybody out and about. Um, if anything changes or there's any uh, significant changes or updates, they'll be um, issued through the city manager's uh, updates at a, at a later time. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Eric, for that. And um, looks like we have a couple questions, Councillor Sorg and Abeta Stubi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I was just curious, do you know what FEMA is doing here? What kind of information they're gathering or whatever else they're doing, Eric? Uh, Mayor, Councilor Sword, FEMA has, has brought down a team they had started originally in Albuquerque and uh, they have groups of individuals that can do mobile sites and they're available to do the vaccines. Uh, that's what they're really doing. Uh, mostly now with the Las Cruces Public Schools is is where they're working at. They did do the 4th of July event. So it's a team to come down and do vaccinations. Uh, there was only five during the 4th of July event. So uh, they're here and available uh, 12 weeks. So they'll be here really till the end of August. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, sir. And uh, thanks, Councilor Beta Stubi. Thank you, Mayor. I did want to give a special thank you to uh, Assistant City Manager, uh, Mr. Enriquez, and to the members of our vaccine task force during this time and for all the work that they've put in. It was really a wonderful collaborative effort from everybody, I would say, across the county uh, to make sure that we got that equity and that we were working um, for the residents here. And I think um, the improving on the numbers uh, really showed um, what can happen when we all work together. So I just wanted to give a thank you uh, to everyone working. Uh, I also uh, spoke with some of the FEMA team that were at the event at the 4th of July. Uh, they were, were reporting 10, I know it's still a smaller number, but uh, they did, uh, we had a couple extra passes. So I gave them um, tickets to go see the concert. Um, just because, you know, they've been working hard and hearing the stories that they've shared um, and the experiences that they've had during this process, I know can be very hard um, for all of our uh, medical health providers. And so a special thank you to them during this time. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah. 
Thanks, uh, Councillor uh, Bita Stuvi, um, Councillor Bencomo, Mayor Pro Tem, for your uh, efforts on the, on the task force. So we appreciate that very much. Uh, and that was something there that, um, you know, I, I can't take credit for. I learned that from the Bloomberg Philanthropies. You know, they set up a, a meeting for us, and, you know, those who chose to go forward with it, I thought it was a good idea. And, and you all uh, were able to take it and run with it. So thanks. We appreciate that very much. I'm sure. That task force helps save lives, and, and um, you all are to be commended. Okay, so uh, Councillor Baker Stuvi, did you have any presentations to make? No. No. Sorry. Okay, I don't. It had you down on one, but on the other one, it had none. So I just wanted to clarify. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead, and uh, this is the conflict of interest statement. This is where I'll ask if any members of the city staff. Uh, city manager's office or city council has any known conflict of interest on any item on the agenda? None. None. Okay, now we also have some public participation. Um, printed off two of them, but one came in really late, so let me just read it. So it says, uh, Dear Mayor, I, I heard through the Las Cruces Tennis Association that the city is considering permanently changing two tennis courts at Lyons park to pickleball courts please don't do this it's not fair to the numerous tennis players in the community there are numerous pickleball courts available around town such as Mearshire, Fringer, Apodaca and others planned due to the geo bond money there is no need to take away or take our courts away I voted for the geo bond and I'm happy that the pickleball players are getting more courts but that is no reason to penalize the tennis players Las Cruces has a large tennis community we didn't mind sharing during the past year, but don't let the pickleball players take over our courts, respectively, Jennifer Cree. Cree. So I thought I had responded to Jennifer, and I apologize, Jennifer, that you had to do uh, send a, the uh, public uh, participation. So, uh, and I looked, and somehow I failed to email you. But basically, what the response would have been is that Two pickleball courts at Lyons are temporarily uh, are there until the construction of the Apodaca pickleball courts are completed. So it's just of a temporary nature, so it's not a permanent nature. And um, this was from uh, Ikani, our assistant city manager, and Sonia Delgado, the uh, Parks, uh, Parks and Rec director. So again, uh, my apologies, uh, Jennifer, for overlooking you on that. We have another, we have two more, <clears throat> excuse me. One is, um, please accept the following as a public comment. My name is George Pearson. I am Vice President of Velo Cruces and Chair of the MPO Bicycle and Pedestrian Facilities Advisory Committee. But I am making these comments on my own behalf. I watched with interest the recent city council work session on bicycle and pedestrian safety. I'm glad that the city council was responding to the MPO resolution that asked the local member entities to take action with respect to bicyclists and pedestrian safety. We must make the bike environment as safe as possible and prevent events that can have devastating life changes for Las Cruces citizens. While the work session is a good start, there is still only the promise of action. Final engineering solutions to suggested changes are not required. Instead, temporary projects could be implemented to see how certain ideas might be better, might be then later perhaps made permanent. The bicycle pop-up project will soon happen as an example. Temporary curb extensions and temporary pedestrian refugees, refu refuge are also possible. One topic that was not discussed at the work session is how traffic speed impacts bicycle and pedestrian safety. As a general rule, the pedestrian and a vehicle crash at 20 miles per hour will result in a survivability rate of 80 to 90%. But a pedestrian and vehicle crash at 40 miles per hour rever reversed with the number of a fatality rate of 80 to 90%. The default speed limit on residential streets is 30 miles per hour. Lowering the speed limit to 25 miles per hour will improve safety and livability in neighborhoods. Albuquerque has done this and has also implemented some speed limits in pedestrian dense downtown. The speed limit on Amador near the Community of Hope and the Gospel Rescue Mission is 40 miles per hour. While there is a slower speed limit for part of the day in this area, it doesn't seem right that such high speed limit be allowed in an area with 
high pedestrian traffic of predominantly economically disadvantaged citizens. There are some roads with a different speed limit going in the other direction and some roads where the speed limit changes without apparent reason. As part of the city council requested citywide assessment of bicycle, pedestrian and traffic safety, please consider evaluating roadway speed limits while there will still be speeders exceeding whatever the posted speed limit is, there is evidence that lowering the speed limit overall slows traffic. Thank you, George Pearson. And I've got one more. This is to the City Council by William Berman and Ronnie Cisneros, July 6, 2021. City Councilors should immediately increase the pay of city police to correct the serious sh shortage of police officers. The counselors are in effect quietly defunding the police by keeping the starting pay low while crime increases in the city. And the counselors inflate the overall city payroll. <clears throat> On May 24, 2021, the police department reported to city council that the city had 52 vacancies on an authorized force of 200 two sworn commission officers. This caused a burden of excessive overtime on the force, Chief Miguel Dominguez said. Also on May 24, police department officials told city council that violent crimes per year had more than doubled from 251 in 2016 to 546 in 2020. In the first four months of 2021, police department reported violent crimes had increased 43% over the first four months of 2020 from 131 to 187. A review of city budgets showed that city council cut the total number of police department employees sworn and not sworn by 11 from 329 in the 2018 budget to 318 in the fiscal year 2020 and 2021 adopted budgets. While the number of city employees went up 89 for the same period from 1,583 to one. 1,672. Besides sworn officers, the police department includes codes and animal control officers and 102 civilian staffers. <clears throat> While city officials have talked about increasing hiring bonuses, paying bonuses to police for city council endorsed activities such as building trust with the community and even, even renting houses in the city for new recruits, a non-competitive starting salary effectively has prevented adequate recruitment, officials said. Chief Dominguez told city council on May 17, we have increased first year officer and cadet pay by $1 per hour and hiring bonuses has also increased from 3,000 to 4,000, but that pales in comparison to other agencies that are offering 10,000 to 20,000 to qualified personnel. At a city council meeting, May 24, officials said Las Cruces paid a starting hourly rate of 1883 compared to $21.27 $21 in Albuquerque and $22.31 in El Paso. The cost of the police department became the focus during city council's budget session, April 26. Councilor Joanna Bencomo pointed to a bar graph entitled, quote, where our money goes, end quote, and complained that the bar for the cost of the police department was by far the highest. Quote, you know, I've been reflecting a lot on sort of this visual representation of what our budget looks like, said Ben Como. When I consider some of those really serious challenges that put a lot of our residents in very vulnerable positions, when I look at this visual representation of the budget, I do not feel that this is representative of those challenges, end quote, she continued. And, you know, for the police department to have such a disproportionate chunk of the budget, to me feels like we need to do some serious reflection on the creation of this budget in terms of how we are really thinking about public safety, comma, rethinking about public safety and what that looks like. The police budget at 27.8 million is about 25% of the city's 111.6 million general fund budget. For there to be a decrease in any sort of property crime, we must meet, meet the people's needs. People must have their needs met and crime will be reduced, Nkomo said. Nkomo promised to keep advocating for council to address her concerns. Rather than take 
temporary measures like bonuses, city council should permanently solve this problem by paying what is fair and necessary to ensure that the police officers have what it needs. Uh, William Berman, and he listed his address, and Ronnie Cisneros, he also, also listed his address. Uh, just a couple things, I just want to respond to, to um, Mr. Berman. And first, I just want to say thank you for um, taking the time and your concern for Los Angeles Police Department. I want to assure you that the other day when City Council unanimously passed the budget as presented, I think that sent a strong message that City Council fully supports uh, Las Cruces Police Department. But a couple things um, that maybe the public isn't aware of. So as you all may very well know, city, county, and state contribute to what they call PARA, Public Employees Retirement Association. And a few years ago, they started having to do some changes because it was, it was, it was um, about 80% funded and they didn't want to see it drop below. So you saw a lot of people starting to retire uh, starting in 2018. Because if they didn't retire by then, they were going to lose their cost of living adjustments for the first seven years, I believe is how it went. And then recently what took place, and now this just applies to the non-commissioned officers. So as Mr. Berman mentioned, there are about 103 uh, non-commissioned officers in the police department. So apparently as of July 1st of this year, if you didn't um, start getting your retirement, you weren't going to get the full subsidy when it came to retiree health care. So again, those are two major changes that, that took place that affects not only just the police department, but actually all uh, city operations. That's why, and it's really good to see so many uh, new faces on making presentations to city council because a lot of the uh, departments, uh, department heads, uh, directors have retired uh, also with the police department. Um, and so I, that's why you're seeing a lot of that. Also, I just wanted to point out that I had a chance to, I think the, you may have seen this, uh, Chief Dominguez uh, just recently put this out in June 4th. So for lateral officers, these are officers who work at another department uh, or whether they're here in New Mexico or perhaps even in El Paso. Uh, when they first get hired, they get a $5,000 bonus. After they complete the field training, another $5,000 bonus. And one day prior to the end of the probation, probationary period, or one year, another 10000 So that's $20,000 for um, lateral transfer. So those are officers who already have that experience. Um, also, for the new cadets that uh, recently are being hired, the base level is a $6,000 incentive bonus. If they have either an associate's degree or four years of honor honorable military service, they get a $10,000 bonus. If they have a bachelor's degree or retirement from the military, $15,000 bonus. And um, I think Councillor Bencomo and Mayor Potemo like this. If you have a bachelor's degree in sociology or psychology, criminology, a $20,000 bonus to start with. So they're, they're hiring that. And then if you have a master's degree uh, in sociology or psychology, criminal justice, $25,000. So don't you guys have a master's degree in uh, sociology or? Okay, 25 grand if you guys want to join the join the force. So I don't think there's an age limit. So those were the those were the things that I just wanted to point out. And so again, we appreciate again, uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, your comments. Okay, so with that, we're going to go to acceptance of the agenda. Uh, this is probably one of the smallest agendas I've ever seen. Three items. So there's there's no consent, I don't believe. But so, by Flores. Second, Gandara. Motion made by Councilor Flores. Second by Mayor Program. So, Christine? This is on the motion to accept the agenda as presented. Councilor Beta Stevie? Yes. Councilor Vasquez? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Councilor Sorg? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Gandara? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Okay, item 7.1, resolution 22 001. Need Move a motion. to approve. Second. Okay, motion made by Councilor Sorg, seconded by Councilor Vasquez. 
and uh, looks like the city attorney Jennifer Vega Brown will be presenting. Oh. Uh, Mayor, Council, this oh. is Robert Cabello. Um, Jennifer's unavailable right now, so I'll be presenting. Um, first off, uh, I'll be doing an initial presentation for resolution. The Comcast franchise agreement will have to come back to Council as an ordinance. Uh, I spoke with Jennifer just now, and she wanted me to remind uh, the Council that this has been two years in the making. Uh, since 2019, and this has gone to council before in work session, but I'll go ahead and we'll start with the, uh, my presentation. From there, I'll actually be, after my presentation, there'll be another presentation from um, the River Oaks, Bob Dushan, our consultants that actually negotiated the agreement, and I will direct most of the questions about the franchise agreement itself to, to him. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Just I guess you hit the other. There you go. Excellent. So, um, the franchise agreement, just to go over some basics, the franchise agreement is where an agreement where a governmental entity like the city confers a corporation like Comcast, it, it gives it that ability to engage in a particular activity uh, using public facilities. And, and in this instance, Comcast would be using a rights of way to put their infrastructure in so they could provide cable services. Um, the previous franchise agreement we had, <laughs> it was uh, done in March 15, 1999, and it was a 12 year, it expired in 12 years. And so uh, it was uh, it expired in 2011. And so uh, uh, definitely a time to have a new franchise agreement. Now, under the proposed franchise agreement, um, certainly the city is authorized under its own ordinances, uh, the Cruces, uh, Las Cruces ta Cable Television Ordinance, federal law and state law. It, it basically authorizes Comcast to maintain their infrastructure for cable services in the city rights away. It's for a 10 year term. And uh, I think um, Bob Dushan could go a little more into detail about this, but Comcast must pay 5%, which is the highest amount of annual gross revenues of recovered from the cable operations. Um, with that, these are your uh, options. At, at the end of the, uh, at the end of the presentations, I will ask council, I need to make a, some slight, uh, amendments uh, based on the recommendations of Bob Dushan. Um, from there, I'll go ahead and I'll either open up the questions or I can go on to Mr. Dushan's uh, presentation. Uh, let's go ahead and go on to uh, Mr. Dushan's presentation. And be before we do, I just want to make an apology to Councillor Flores. I inadvertently left her out. She was also on the uh, task force for the um, COVID-19. So thank you, Councillor Flores. I apologize. I was looking at some notes here and I, oh, I, I don't know how I did that. So I'll let you uh, buy me a lunch for that mistake. So appreciate it. All right, Mr. Dushan, do you, oh, well, there's, uh, there's two of you. That's right. Yes. You guys are, you guys are twins, right? Yes, we are, Mayor. It's, it's good to see you again. And counselors, thank you very much. What we'd like to do is uh, run through a very brief PowerPoint to bring you up to speed as to where we are with Comcast. Uh, this is a good news scenario. Uh, this subject to your approval today, and the vote will not be today, as Robert said. He's, he's going to bring this back in the form of an ordinance, but conceptually, subject to your approval, um, agreement has been reached between Comcast and the city. Uh, the next slide, please. I'm going to need you to, Bob, if you don't mind, state your name, and this is going to be really important for both you and your brother because you guys okay. look alike, and, and you know we won't be able to say who's talking. That, thank you, Mayor. I'm Bob Dushan. I'm the Vice President of River Oaks Communications Corporation. And I'm Tom Dushan, and I'm the President of River Oaks Communications Corporation. Thank you. Uh, Robert, the next slide, please. So what is being proposed is a 10-year non-exclusive franchise. And I want to emphasize the words non-exclusive. Uh, this franchise in no way... Uh, prohibits the city from granting additional wireline cable franchises should another competitor wish to enter the Las Cruces marketplace. Um, fees, as Robert has said, cable franchise fees are capped under federal law to 5% of the annual cable service gross revenues received by the cable operator. Under federal law, cities cannot receive under a cable franchise uh, a percentage of the gross revenues on either internet or telephone service. The next slide, please. So we're here today to follow council's direction. 
Uh, in this franchise, we have preserved the right of your government channel to continue operating and provisioned for a transformation of that channel from SD to HD without uh, signal degradation. We've talked about the 5% franchise fee and there are numerous provisions in this cable franchise so that you continue to maintain oversight of your streets and your right of way. The next slide, please. When we, when we first undertook this project, uh, there were choices we could have extended the franchise, but as Robert said, that technically expired back in 2011. We could have amended that franchise, but we thought it was in the best interest of the city to enter into a new circa 2021 cable franchise with Comcast. And as you all know, a lot has changed in the last decade. And that's what this franchise represents. It's a, it's a franchise that incorporates best practices from other cities, not just in New Mexico, from, but from around the country as well. The next slide, please. Tom, would you like to speak a little bit about the um, other components of this franchise? Yes, I would. Thank you very much, Mayor, and Councilors, and others in attendance. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, the franchise which we have negotiated with. Can you just state Tom, your name again, please? Sure. It is uh, Tom Dushan, and I'm the president of uh, River Oaks Communications Corporation. We are, uh, Bob and I are based in Colorado. I'm in Colorado Springs and Bob's in Denver. <clears throat> we have uh, spoken with and met several of you before, so we're glad to provide this, uh, this update today. We have negotiated and drafted a, a modern, a detailed, extensive new Comcast cable franchise rather than extending or amending, as Bob indicated, the, the 1999 Comcast franchise. In addition to this Comcast franchise, as Bob mentioned, it's, it's non-exclusive, meaning other cable operators can provide cable service upon receiving a franchise in the city. These, and these are wireline cable operators I'm referring to. The city can continue to explore future fiber arrangements with Comcast uh, and other companies that, that we've listed here. Um, so it's the, the plants that Comcast actually uses can provide several types of services. That's different than a company that wants to provide a fiber agreement with you as you, a fiber agreement to run their fiber through Las Cruces or to provide uh, other kinds of uh, services, telecommunications related services. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so here are some of the key elements in the cable franchise. The gross revenues de uh, definition is very extensive. Um, there is uh, there are provisions for insurance coverage uh, for the city. Uh, the franchise calls for generally required construction bonds so that in the event Comcast were to undertake construction and there were um, uh, work that needed to be followed up on, uh, the city has those kinds of protections. Um, I will say things of you know, and we've we've spent a lot of time negotiating with Comcast, and I and I do want to share with you that. You know, Comcast, we, this is not a situation where we get, uh, you know, a, a lot of complaints regarding Comcast. I know that there are people that are upset about or don't like the rates necessarily, but that's something that the city cannot control under federal law. Uh, we have provided for a letter of credit for an uncured franchise breach if one were to occur. We factored in negotiations based upon the Federal Communications Commission's third order. Uh, that's very detailed. Um, Basically, what we did in the in this franchise is preserve the city's rights in that regard. It, that order goes to the uh, ability of cable operators to potentially uh, have offsets against franchise fees for uh, free drops to city and schools. Uh, there was a federal court of appeals decision, uh, which basically said <clears throat> that uh, if if that were to happen, uh, any offsets that would, might be sought would be at marginal cost. So that's uh, the impact of that order has, has changed significantly to the good for the city. The term of the franchise as mentioned uh, previously is 10 years. Uh, we've provided for the carriage of the city channel in both SD and HD high definition concurrently. And we've provided for the city to be able to implement a residential subscriber per month fee for video production equipment. 
It's a very modest fee. It starts at 45 cents per cable subscriber per month. Uh, it um, decreases over time uh, after uh, several years to 35 cents per subscriber, residential subscriber per month, and then to 25 cents per residential subscriber per month. These numbers were the result of uh, extensive work which has been done in connection with the city of Las Cruces and um, the uh, video production related uh, equipment needs of the city. Uh, and so these, these costs correspond to what the projected needs are of the city on a, on a going forward basis. Um, I know that this has been a subject before, we'll be glad to talk about it. Uh, Comcast under federal law can include these as a line item on subscribers bills. Uh, it's a de minimis number though, uh, because over time rates do go up from cable companies. And this is in, with this fee, uh, services are given back to the constituents of Las Cruces. Next slide, please. Tom, if I could quickly add, uh, it's that's solely at the city's election. If you want to implement the per, per subscriber per month government access fee, that's your choice. It's not obligatory. We've preserved that right for you to do so in the franchise, and then it's up to you. Okay. Yeah, that was Bob Dushin talking. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, Mayor. Okay, and this is Tom Dushin. Uh, so uh, we have provided for detailed right-of-way construction requirements in the franchise. Uh, Comcast is required to build where there are at least 15 homes per quarter mile. That is beneficial both in terms of a cable television standpoint and a, and a broadband standpoint. There is a, detail, a detailed default section with remedies for non-performance and liquidated damages. Um, additionally, and this is something that um, is outside of the franchise, uh, but it's very positive. We have talked with Comcast about creating lift zones uh, in Las Cruces to provide uh, broadband opportunities for uh, socioeconomically challenged individuals. Uh, Comcast across the country, and some of you all may have seen this um, <clears throat> on uh, advertisements, to their credit, Comcast is setting up, I believe well, it's a lot, I believe it's a 1,000 lift zones. I don't want to uh, misspeak on this, but across the country, uh, they're, they're working to, and they're going to community centers, and they're going to uh, a lot of uh, different uh, organizations and neighborhoods to, uh, because given the pandemic, as we all know, uh, there were significant challenges for particularly school age uh, students uh, to be able to uh, interact, do their homework, get their assignments. And so these lift zones are gonna provide uh, more uh, local places where uh, people can go and have broadband connectivity the thought bring that being that this can help in closing the digital divide. Next slide, please. If, uh, and this is Tom, if, uh, Bob, do you wanna go ahead, please? Bob, you're on mute, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. This is Bob Dushin again. Uh, the next steps for council, where we are glad to answer any questions you, may, you might have today. As I mentioned at the outset, this franchise has been reviewed internally and approved at Comcast and by Comcast. And under federal law, uh, if there are any members of the public who wish to um, weigh in on this matter, uh, the Cable Acts provide that they must be given notice and opportunity to be heard. So whether it's today or at that time when you actually take up the vote uh, on the franchise via ordinance, as Robert has said, uh, they, they have that ability under the Cable Acts to do so. With it that, that like, our presentation, Mayor. It looks like we have a couple of council members who have some questions, Councilor Sorg and Councilor Vasquez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to the Dushan brothers uh, for your presentation, appreciate that. Um, um, as we all know, or you should know from the news that uh, high-speed internet uh, broadband has been a hot topic in the country, um, especially since the pandemic has uh, 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 required people to use it more. Um, and as you know, right now, most of us, and if not all of us are using uh, broadband for uh, this meeting. And um, I'm actually using Comcast uh, for it too. Um, my question concerns 
uh, the service. Uh, uh, my broadband happens to be a, a, a cable, okay? Comes off of a cable. So my question to you, I'm, I'm, first of all, let me ask about uh, River Oaks. Are you a subcontractor of Con Comcast? Uh, no, sir. We are an independent consulting firm based in Colorado that uh, has worked with, on behalf of local governments uh, for over three decades. So we are not here on behalf of Comcast. I believe there are two representatives from Comcast who are also, uh, they were invited to this Zoom meeting as well. So the answer to your question is no, we are not affiliated with Comcast. Oh, okay. So my question can't be directed to Mr. Mr. Dushin and Mr. Dushin. Um, I'll just ask it if anybody can answer, and, and if not, that's okay. Um, I just wondered, uh, can you, uh, talking to Comcast, uh, are you or will you replace any of these slower cables this less with less bandwidth with fiber optics in uh, Las Cruces or all well, Las Cruces? Uh, this, this is uh, Bob again. Uh, if either John or Aaron is on this call and wish to answer that question on behalf of Comcast, I, I'd encourage you to do so. Yes. Hi, my name is Aaron Muffaletto. I'm with Comcast in Albuquerque. Um, happy to answer your question. So if there are any particular areas that you're concerned about, we're happy to look into it. Um, we don't have any way to assess on a like citywide level. Um, what we try to do is as issues come up, we assess them as they come up. Um, we haven't had any specific inquiries from Las Cruces, but I'm definitely happy to take a look at like what areas you're specifically looking at. Probably most areas, <laughs> not any one specific area. Um, as our population, the older part of the city continues to grow uh, and the demand for internet service in continues to increase. Um, to me, it seems like uh, some of the infrastructure for internet service uh, could be, and I think it is, um, not quite up to snuff, uh, not, not quite good enough for certain high speed uh, service or, yeah, high speed services. So there is no general plan to replace uh, cable with fiber optics? We do have fiber in um, some areas of town. Um, it really depends on what the consumer requests though. So they could have one gig internet and receive, you know, blazing speeds, um, but they could also receive us have a slower speed. And if they have you know, six people on it, watching Netflix, you know, streaming, doing all these things, it is going to slow their internet down. So if there are specific concerns where like a family is having issues with internet speeds, it usually is because, you know, a lot of people are streaming um, or they have several different, you know, computers, internet, like different things connected to their internet. I mean, for example, I... Um, I probably have over 20 things connected to my internet right now, and I'm only one person in my house. So mm -hmm. sometimes we forget about how many things we have connected to internet that slows it down. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I've experienced. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. And, and I will just offer if, if any of you do have any issues or concerns from your constituents, please bring them to me um, and I'm happy to address them as they come up. Thanks, Aaron. I, I can say I have both. I have both uh, Comcast and CenturyLink uh, only for case one goes down or and they, I'm happy with them both. They've both been great, great service and speed. Uh, Councillor Vasquez and then Councillor Flores. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Mr. Tom and Bob Dushin. I appreciate the presentation and bringing this back to council. I think it's been quite some time since we discussed this franchise agreement, uh, but back we're, we're getting to discuss it again today. Um, the first question is around the franchise fee. Uh, 
is, is it right that five percent is the maximum allowed um, to, by federal law? That is correct, Counselor. Five percent of the cable service gross revenues. Okay, great. Um, I, I remember, I recall that the last discussion we had on this franchise uh, renewal um, also had some thoughts around customer service and the delivery of customer services in in person. Um, I think Comcast closed its last um, in person, uh, I guess, retail operation or shop here um, a few years ago, and so. Uh, I know that Comcast doesn't have a physical presence as far as I know in the city, and I'm assuming everything gets done through the mail or through the internet. Um, uh, so Mr. Duchin, or th this question may be more for Aaron, um, mm -hmm. in terms of the delivery of um, customer services, um, are there any plans for Comcast to open up a store here in town? And um, maybe you can comment just in general about uh, Comcast uh, customer service performance. I know it was rated as one in terms of customer service for many years and, and wondering if there's been some improvements in that front. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Vasquez. So we actually do have a store um, in Las Cruces. It's one of the newer um, renovated stores. Um, and I, if you give me a minute, I can look up the exact location, but I've been there a few times and it is more of a um, um, I mean, it's it looks newer, um, and it is off of the interstate. Um, I think it's off I-25. Yeah. Um, Counselor or Aaron, it's next to B-Dubs, Counselor yeah. Vasquez. It's, uh, it's, but it's called Xfinity, and it's really cool. It's a nice store. It's, it's very that's state right. That's right. Okay, I know exactly where it's at. Yes, it's a, the names throw me off, um, but you're right. I, I've seen it there in that plaza. Yeah, and so so we have the store there, um, and like I said before, you know we we always try to address customer issues as they come up. Uh, we haven't received um, any like formal complaints from the city ever. Um, so I mean, as far as any big issues, I'm not aware of any. If there's anything going on, uh, but I will say, as a company, um, we are always continuing to strive to be better. Um, you know, than the year before, as far as our customer service goes. Thank you, Aaron. And um, I know I think several, or I don't know if it's several, but at least the city of Philadelphia added some customer service provisions to its franchise agreement with Comcast, um, I think as a result of, of really poor marks on the company for a long time. Um, but, but I understand that those are getting better. And so um, I'm happy to hear that. And so, um, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that that's necessary for this type of, uh, for our franchise agreement. Um, uh, but, you know, that's one thing that has been consistent with at least folks that I talked to that received this service for many years, um, uh, both in service outages and, and service appointment calls and just like, you know, having a hard time reaching customer service um, through the various kind of phone systems that Comcast operates. Um, but if, if you have any specifics in terms of, of percentage of um, you know, uh, satisfaction with customers um, would love to hear those, um, Aaron, or, or if you don't, maybe a follow-up would be great just to have the confidence that, that, um, that you guys are, are, are improving. Yeah, thank you. I don't have any specifics for the Las Cruces community. I do know they have been improving um, every year. Um, so I don't have any specific numbers on that end. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then this question is for Mr. One of the uh, Duchin brothers, um, and it's around the lift zones. Um, it, is there a reason why we can't include the, the construction of those lift zones into this franchise agreement? Yes, this is Tom Duchin. Uh, counselor, the, the reason is that um, – and we think, number one, we think the lift zones are a great idea. So that's very positive. Um, under federal law, we cannot include internet requirements, internet related requirements as part of a cable franchise. And federal law is very specific to that effect. In other words, we could not, we could not say as part of this <clears throat> franchise, Comcast would be required to have X number of lift zones in Las Cruces. And I know if we could do that, it'd be a great idea. But federal law is very, very specific on this. 
that uh, internet and uh, cable television are classified two different ways. And I know that can be frustrating for you know people because it's the same plant that's delivering cable and phone and internet. Um, but it's a very detailed legal uh, legal situation that says we could not do that. If I could just ask Aaron, if you could please comment on uh, Comcast and lift zones in Las Cruces, that would be helpful, please. I would be happy to, yes. Um, so we have been working with um, Las Cruces communities uh, for the last few months on the lift zones. And I'm just looking real quick to see how many we have. I know we have at least 10, it's probably closer to 15 areas that we are looking at for lift zones. Yeah, we have at least 11, 11 we're working on, and I think we have another five that have been completed. Um, so those are more targeted and um, like areas of need, um, or maybe it is close to an area that doesn't have service. Um, so families can use it, you know, for internet. Um, so we have quite a bit of those that are, um, that are going up throughout the community. Um, and I was also going to circle back. I forgot to add. Um, so the, this franchise agreement does include customer service standards as well. So those are included in this agreement. And from a context, this is Tom Dushin, from a context standpoint, uh, and as, as Bob indicated, our business River Oaks, represents the city. I will share with you in our work that we do across the Western United States and elsewhere, there are cities that are vying for having to have lift zones. And the fact that Comcast has this many in the works is, is, is great news in Las Cruces. And we've got, you know, other cities where if they could get two or three, they'd be very, you know, it, it would be a good news scenario. What's happened is there's a certain amount of resources and Comcast is doing this across the country. So um, I wish we could put in the franchise, but I will share with you, I think it's great, great news that what we're all hearing today. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you both. Um, and thank you, Aaron. Those are all my questions, Mayor. Thanks, Councillor. Before I get to Councillor Flores and Aaron, also, I want to thank you for, especially very helpful during COVID, but the special that Comcast has for our lower income families, the 999 internet, uh, that was really beneficial for, for a lot of families. So we appreciate that. Councilor Flores. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, uh, Mr. Duchin and Mr. Duchin. And thank you, uh, Aaron Mufaletto. Um, I, uh, the, the question I have for you, Ms. Mufaletto, is um, New Mexico as a state, uh, you know, everybody in the state is talking about needing more broadband. So um, how is, is uh, Comcast in any position to be working with uh, different municipalities or with the state government to assure that broad, uh, broadband is available, especially in the Native American um, communities? I mean, a, a lot of, there's just a lot of, because it's a, most of the state is quite rural but the um, Native American communities have been negatively, um, supremely uh, affected. And we found that out because of COVID and uh, everything that went with that, schools and children and that sort of stuff. So do you have any info on that? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Flores. Um, so real quick, I will just address, so this agreement is specifically for cable, so it has nothing yeah. to do with broadband, but um, right. As far as your question goes, um, we are looking for other areas to expand, um, especially cities that want to work with us, like with federal funding, um, you know, to reach the last mile, uh, reach more areas where people need to get connected to the internet. Um, it has been hard, um, I will admit, like for us as a company to reach a lot of areas because of the return on investment. Um, we are a business at the end of the day, so... You know, we just need to make sure that we have a return on all of our investments. Um, in regards to like Native American communities, uh, I mean, I, I think it really depends what areas you're looking at. We have a few communities we're currently working with um, where we've been trying to you know, help them as much as we can. Um, but other areas where they're, it's too remote for us, like it's just too far mm -hmm. off the grid from where we're located. Um, so I'll say like some of 
I work a lot with some other partners when I receive inquiries. Um, I, I usually leave it to the small businesses to work with them on. Um, and they've been doing a fantastic job um, in being able to utilize a lot of the bro broadband funding to help the Native American communities you know, reach those areas in most need. This is Bob Dushin, if I could, to supplement yes. what you said. Uh, I'm pleased to, and you all may, be know, may already know this, there have been several um, recent broadband grants made available to Native American communities throughout the United States. Uh, Tom was on the phone earlier, I should say on a Zoom call earlier today with a tribe in Montana. Um, and so it, it's, it's a very positive report. There is a lot of money that's been allocated specifically for tribes nationwide. One of the challenges is, is to help those tribes be aware of those grant opportunities and then encourage them to actually apply for the grants to your other question, there's some specific broadband funding coming out of Washington that is, is, is designated specifically for, pri for private public partnerships between cities and companies such as Comcast. So if, and I'm not speaking for Comcast, but if the city is interested in looking into a P3, a public private partnership with a company such as Comcast to expand broadband, um, that's one of the criteria in the application grant that the city, a city and a, a provider need, need to collectively go after the funding. Tom, did you want to add to that? Yes. Um, with respect to Native American communities, there is a very recent, what we call a notice of funding opportunity. And while it's very detailed and a lot of page, a lot of, you know, complex and a lot of pages in length, basically what it says is that Native American communities, and I hope that there are Native American community members or, or others on this call who could reach out to, to Native American communities. Um, there is um, a grant through NTIA uh, that would make, you have to apply for the grant and you have to, you have to prove that the need's there, but it's basically between uh, $10 million and $50 million for broadband infrastructure for a Native American community. There is uh, another um, another part of it which goes from uh, about two hundred fifty thousand up to plus or minus to uh, two and a half million dollars for a broadband. And I would encourage those of you who have uh, connectivity with Native American communities to let them know about this. These particular grants, and they all have different time frames, so we can't just say it's all by the state. But some of these have a September first deadline as far as applying for these grants. Additionally, there is another section which provides that um, basically $500,000 can be available to Native American communities and connecting with certain broadband uses. So um, just to supplement what has been said, um, um, I, I would hope that, uh, that, the, that the Native American communities would look into this further and look at uh, possible partnerships with Comcast and with other companies, as we call them, public-private partnerships, um, and maybe their opportunities depending upon geographic location and proximity and, and geographic territory that's covered, that there could be some very good things that could be done for Native American communities. In this and this is Bob Dushing, and these range from reasons for telehealth, distance education, um, economic development, the, the, the confusing thing in, out of Washington is it's not just one agency. It's the NTIA, it's the USDA, it uh, could be the Department of Commerce. So these grants are available in different amounts from different federal agencies. Um, so that makes it challenging. But the main thing is to get the word out to the, to the Native American communities that this funding is available. And this is just not, this is designated funding. This is just not a hypothetical. Wow, thank you. I um, you you did say that there was uh, a notice of funding opportunities, and I um, I would hope that the uh, Native American communities um, are have been made aware. I mean, there it's almost like a um, catch twenty two uh, that there's a need to be aware, but how do you become aware if you don't know that it's there? So uh, I just hope that. Uh, maybe Comcast, uh, 
because your role is totally different insofar as River Oaks Communications Corporation is, is concerned, uh, Monsieur uh, Duchin. But uh, as far as uh, Ms. Mufaletto I, uh, is concerned, I would make that request to, um, because you are all over the state. And I understand that there are problems with uh, rural areas and remote areas, but that's exactly the problem that we have because they are uh, rural and remote. And, um, and I, w one of the, the, the big uh, concerns that we all share, I believe, as a community uh, of, um, of people is that our children are, are, are really missing out on educational uh, opportunities and um, in, in many, many ways. There's a state mandated uh, decision, Supreme Court of New Mexico decision that has mandated uh, schools to implement certain pra practices to assure that children aren't um, left out of their um, educational um, experience. And, um, and there's been findings that, um, that, they're, that they are missing out. And so that's just my, and, and we, of course, as a city, um, we are affiliated with, we do have a JPA with our with our local school district, but I'm just wondering, I guess it's my ask, you know, for you to somehow um, look into this and uh, because we can't, I mean, I certainly don't have, you know, I'm not with Comcast, but if I were, I would definitely do something to find out exactly uh, how these communities can be helped. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Dushin, Bob, and Tom, and thank you, Ms. Mufaletto. Thank you You're very welcome. much. You're welcome. Hey, thanks, Councillor Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Mr. Zuzian and Aaron. Um, wanted to ask if the cable goes out, how are you communicating to our constituency? Do you have um, information that, or a map of some sort that says this is where the targeted area is having issues and you're working on it? And how do you communicate with, with the public? Yes, Councillor, thanks for that question. So we have a few different ways. So some people will opt in to receive texts if they receive it, if there's an outage going on. Other areas, other ways is just going on the app to see like, you know, what's going on with my internet and then it'll pop up that you have a outage in your area. Um, and you can also look that up um, like on a public, public facing online website. Um, so there's a few different ways that we communicate that with our customers. Okay, all right. I appreciate that. Th those are all my questions, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just looked up real quick where we had those lift zones. It looked like it was a Boys and Girls Club, and then it said, um, and I'm trying to get confirmation that they've been put in the community centers, which if they did, that's another I think we have about six community centers, six or seven, so that'd be a close to eight uh, lift zones. And and then I found out that when I talked about the the 9.99 income, I mean 9.99 internet for the lower uh, income families, uh, looks like the number of affected families was 44,000, 22,000 households. So thank you for that. That's really good. Okay, um, if there's no more questions, uh, Bob or Tom, are you um, finished? Yes, Mayor. Uh, if anyone else has any other questions, we're glad to answer them. Thank I you. Have That's Bob. All right, it's Bob, thank you. Mr. Mayor, this is yes. Tom. I, could you just repeat the piece of data you just shared? Oh, okay. So the lift zones, which I believe are the free internet, like hotspots, so to speak, were installed at the Boys and Girls Club of Las Cruces, as well as, um, and I was trying to get confirmation that they were, they're supposed to be put in all the community centers. So from, um, you know, Eastside, the Munson, all those different places, uh, Frank O'Brien, um, the, the um, cafe, what's that cafe over there on the east side? East side? And then, um, and the Benavita Center. And then <clears throat> they also have for those um, uh, lower income families, they have a $9.99 per month for high speed internet. And that affected 44,000 residents or 20, about 20,000 households. 
Thank you. Okay, I, I had one quick question, uh, Bob or, or Tom. It was regarding, and I don't know if you, you were able to do anything with this, but um, so right now was the cable, let's see. I, I just remember that channel 22, um, if you don't have cable, I, I don't know if you still can watch channel 22 without cable. Uh, it used to be the public station at the university, something like that. And so I was wondering if we were able to get anything so that they could watch the uh, cable channel 20. Were you aware of that or we weren't able to do anything like that? Uh, Mayor, we, uh, we took oh, a run at that. This is Bob Dushin. Thank you. Mayor, we took a run at that. My understanding is the New Mexico State University programming and PBS are shown on channel two uh, of the cable system. Um, we, at, and Aaron, maybe you can answer this question as well. In terms of people who don't have cable TV, their ability to get that signal or not get that signal, um, that is beyond uh, Comcast uh, cable franchise responsibilities. So um, the good news is it's already on the cable channel. Now, I, Aaron, do you happen to know if that, if that program is available on a local PBS station in Las Cruces? Yes, uh, Mayor. Um, we do have the PBS station there. I don't know how the city, like what information the city sends um, because I believe Actually, the PBS channel, I believe NMSU works with that one to create the content for that channel. Um, but I will say, if you don't have Comcast cable, you're unable to see the channel unless you all are also pushing information to a website somewhere. Um, but there, that would be the only way for um, someone to see it is through their Comcast cable. Yeah, and when with when when this first started, I don't think the city was doing much with <clears throat> YouTube, but we're doing that now. Um, I guess I just remember as a kid, you know, you know, we we didn't have cable. We could only watch four, nine, and thirteen, and then Channel Twenty Two. So, uh, and Channel Nine had the best reception. So that's uh, you know back then. Now it's different now, of course, um, for our Channel Seven and Channel Four users, but um, and then Channel Twenty Two. So that's why I thought. 22 was the university and and so i didn't know so okay well i appreciate you guys looking into that that was my only my only question thank you okay, well, if there's if there's nothing further then um it's been moved a second so christine this is on the motion to approve resolution 22-001 councillor beta stevie yes councillor vasquez yes Councillor Bencomo? Yes. Councillor Sorg? Yes. Councillor Flores? Yes. Councillor Gandara? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Okay, so next we're gonna go to item 7.2. And thanks, uh, by the way, for everyone working on that agreement. That took a long time, I know. Uh, Jennifer and Rob and the Dushans and, and Aaron and everybody. I appreciate that very much. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this is, You're welcome. Mr. Mayor, this is Yvonne Flutus, if I may. Do you want to still talk about the franchise agreement? No, I want to talk about the Dushans. Oh, sure, I, go ahead. I don't want to talk about them behind their back, so I just... <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's should, very should nice. Yeah, right, you should. Um, it's very nice to see you. I, I wanted to thank you, um, and it's very nice to see the two of you again. And... Uh, they are, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, you can tell them apart. And the reason is because they're uh, mirror twins. And you can tell by the way they part their hair. And uh, when we had our finance uh, meeting, um, yeah, they said they would definitely. But, you know, I forgot, Bob or Tom. Uh, did I ask whether one was right-handed and the other was left-handed? Um, uh, Counselor, I don't believe so. Um, we, we are both right-handed. Uh, we also have dimples on the opposite side, is what is <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, part yeah. of your hair, so. But that, yeah. but you, you're, you're right. We part, our, yeah, yeah. we part our hair on different sides. I've never, I hadn't thought about that. Thank you. Right. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you again, Bob and Tom. Good seeing you. You're very you. welcome. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, so now we'll go to item 7.2, Council Bill number 21-045, ordinance number 2978. Need a motion to second, please. Move to approve. Second by Flores. Okay, motion made by Councilor Sorek, second by Councilor Flores, and Catherine Harrison Rogers will be presenting. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. Um, let's see if I can advance my slides. There we are. Uh, this is a zone change um, from A2, which is actually a defunct zone change, a zoning district. Uh, it was a rural agricultural district. It's, uh, it's from 1981, our old code. Um, and so what they're proposing is to try to obtain a C2 zoning designation, which is a commercial medium intensity zoning designation. The intent behind it is to expand potential uses on the site, such as uh, commercial retail sales, or possible institutional uses. Um, again, this would also facilitate compliance with the 2001 zoning code. Uh, the particular property in question is a little less than an acre. It's located at 3300 West Picacho. This area is near La Llorona Park. Um, it's adjacent to Roadrunner Lane. So it's really on the outskirts of town. Um, <clears throat> again, it was zoned A2. Um, it is along a major east-west corridor, that being, of course, uh, Picacho Avenue. It's a major arterial roadway. Uh, so commercial types of uses are really frequent um, along types of roads such as this and are located nearby. Uh, this particular property is adjacent to some residential housing, which is to uh, the northeast. There's also some con conditional and industrial uses just to the southeast and west of this particular property. Right now, the property has uh, an accessory building as well as an old single family home that at some point in time had been converted uh, to and used as a church. Uh, here's some views uh, west from Picacho Avenue and also from Roadrunner Lane looking onto the property. You can see that, that house sort of um, in this little corner right over here. You can see the roadway that we're talking about. Again, Picacho is a major um, uh, arterial roadway. Uh, it, it's meant to have uses such as these, uh, such as commercial uses along it. Again, you can see this is looking um, eastbound. You can see the mountains in the distance and you can see the industrial and commercial uses nearby. Um, from a zoning perspective, you can see the subject property outlined. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my pointer. Um, in blue, it's designated as A2. It's that green color, which again uh, is that defunct um, agricultural zone. And you can see by all the pinks and the reds that it is surrounded uh, by some commercial zoning. Uh, in the purple, of course, this is some industrial nearby. And then the yellow uh, is the single family residential. All of the white that you're seeing on this map is outside the city limits. And for the most part, those areas um, are residential and or agricultural. Here's an aerial to give you a better sense of what's on the ground. Um, if you all are familiar with Icebox Brewing, it's located nearby, uh, sort of towards the, the south eastern corner of the map. Um, staff looked at this and reviewed this against the current code. We did feel as though it was supported by Elevate Las Cruces. This area on the future development map is designated as the rural neighborhood. Um, basically, types of commercial uses that support um, those types of services in rural neighborhoods um, are appropriate. So the C2 zoning would be appropriate at this location. Um, and again, we also looked at the purpose and intent statements uh, in the code, as well as the planning and zoning's decision criteria, and all of those seem to be in alignment with the recommendation of approval. On April 27, 2021, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission did review this during a public hearing. Uh, there was no public input provided, um, and the discussion was based on the findings, which are also outlined in your packet today, and it was a recommendation for approval of six to zero to zero. There was one commissioner absent um, during that meeting. Again, uh, these findings are outlined in a little bit more detail uh, in your packet, but ultimately staff and planning and zoning did determine that this zone change request would allow 
for um, the attraction and retention of businesses um, in this area. It would also allow for an expansion of uses allowed in this zoning uh, district of C2. Also, the property is located on an arterial roadway where commercial uses are uh, encouraged and the property will be brought into compliance with the 2001 municipal code. Um, and of course, planning and zoning did look at this from their perspective and recommended approval. Again, we received no input from the public regarding this particular zone change and all of the reviewing departments and agencies were in support of the zone change. So again, staff is recommending that this particular uh, property be rezoned from A2 to C2. Um, and if there are any questions about the property, I will stand for those. Um, unfortunately, I did not see the applicant or their representative um, listed in uh, those in attendance today, um, but I would be happy to answer any questions that might come up. Thanks, Catherine. And let me just say to the to my colleagues, normally I would have put this on the consent, but as you can tell, the agenda was so light that I didn't want it to go that quick. And so I figured just have some discussion. And um, and so anyways, looks like uh, that uh, businesses counselor, Councillor Bencomo has a question. This is in District 4, correct, Councillor? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Catherine. I was actually curious if you had heard from the property owners what their, if they had a plan already and if they had been um, thinking about something already to go here. No, ma'am, nothing in particular. Uh, essentially, they wanted the opportunity to be able to market this um, in, in some way, as I understand it. It's a property that's just been out of compliance for so long. This was a way to bring it into compliance and, frankly, uh, to to meet some of the characteristics of that commercial corridor that runs east-west into town. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Catherine, do you, just my other question is about the, these kinds of um, properties zoned this kind of way, if there's a lot of them, and if the only way to bring them into compliance is for when someone submits an application to do so, or is the new land code going to be addressing some of these properties? That's an excellent, an excellent question, Counselor. So, so to answer that, yes, we do have these properties scattered throughout town. It's not only this particular zoning, this is this agricultural zone that's, that's this sort of remnant. We also have um, something called UR that you'll see throughout town. Again, that was also sort of a rural residential type of zone. And yes, if the property has been vacant for over a year, or if they plan doing on in any significant um, expansion of a use that's in existence there, it does require that they come into compliance with the zone change or other sort of mechanism available in our code. Now, that being said, uh, the land use code revisions that we are undergoing at this point in time, um, otherwise known as realized Las Cruces, uh, will uh, address some of these issues. Um, part of that process will include uh, revisions to the zoning map uh, to reflect what's in Elevate Las Cruces and also to fix problems like these. And so we do expect that this, there, this will be fixed in the future. Thanks so much, Catherine. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, if there's nothing further, uh, Christine. This is on the motion to approve Ordinance 2978. Councilor Abeda Stevie? Yes. Councilor Vasquez? Yes. Councillor Bencomo? Yes. Councillor Sorg? Yes. Councillor Flores? Yes. Councillor Gandara? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Okay, now we go to board appointments and it looks like we have one. I'm gonna need a motion and a second on this. This is to appoint Dan Kernut to the Capital Improvements Advisory Committee at large. So moved. Is there a second? Oh, I'll second. Yeah. Oh, well, okay, Councillor Vasquez, second. Councillor uh, Flores motion, second by Councillor Vasquez. Christine? This is on the motion to appoint Dan Kernut to the Capital Improvements Advisory Committee. Um, Councilor Beta Stuvi? Yes. Councilor Vasquez? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? 
Yes. Councillor Sorg? Yes. Councillor Flores? Yes. Councillor Gondra? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Okay, next is notice of proposed ordinances. There'll be no public discussion. Council may ask staff for clarifications on proposed ordinance 9.1, which is Council Bill 22 001, ordinance number 2979. Bring it forward. Okay, bring it forward. Um, now we're going to go to Council Member Board reports and comment. So I have just a couple things. <clears throat> One is I just want to Thank all those involved. I know uh, Ikani was there and I know um, um, facilities and Parks and Rec, everyone who put such a great job in communications office, such a great job on the July 4th. Um, yes, you know, the other day was uh, fantastic. The, the bands, the food, the um, music, the crowds, everything. And I also want to extend uh, thanks to Chancellor Arvisu. I saw him personally there, but still just want to thank Chancellor and President Floros for their support and having a joint uh, city university. It works out really good. The traffic flows really well. And I think if, if we have it there next year, the, uh, the uh, university on and off ramp will be completed and it'll move even quicker. And also, um, I was going to let, I was going to turn it over to uh, Connie. And he's probably going to have Rochelle from the uh, Economic Development Department speak. I don't know if you've heard, but apparently um, Virgin Galactic is going to be doing some some stuff this weekend. So uh, this coming weekend, pretty exciting things. So there's going to be a lot of media coming in here to Las Cruces. I mean, a lot. So um, Connie, do you want to talk a little bit about what's happening? And I think Richard Branson has something to do with that. And sure, sure, Mayor. Uh, I don't want to speak to that, but I know somebody who does, and I don't want to steal their thunder, so I'll let Rochelle uh, take it away. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you. Just for the record, Rochelle Miller-Hernandez with Visit Las Cruces under City Manager's Office. So we're very excited, Mayor and Council. Um, as you know, it's been a long time coming, the, uh, the, the big launch. Uh, with Virgin Galactic and so Sir Richard Branson will be here. They will be launching um, Sunday. We will have two uh, watch parties going on with the live stream viewing. One will be at the Rio Grande Theater. The doors will open at 6.30 a.m. This is an early morning flight, so the doors will open at 6.30 a.m. Uh, at both uh, the Rio Grande Theater and the Council Chambers at City Hall. Um, we'll have very light refreshments, and um, currently, we believe the viewing will last to about 9 or 10. It just depends. Um, uh, Sir, Br Sir Richard Branson, of course, is going to make a, um, a whole production out of it, as we, we all know, know him. So he'll have some uh, pre- and post uh, things going on uh, besides the live stream of the launch uh, during the actual um, flight. So hopefully everything will go well. They tested out the uh, streaming um, capabilities during the last test flight and everything was perfect. Now, just uh, for any of the public that's listening there, you cannot go onto the grounds of Spaceport America or around anywhere probably nearby to view the launch. It is a horizontal horizontal launch yes not a vertical launch so you can't really see anything unless you're there on on the ground so they're going to have very limited access and that's why we're having these community watch parties so that um, those who want to celebrate together uh, on this great accomplishment uh, this is only one of many many launches to come um, we're putting together some facts i know we've had several press uh, inquiries we're putting together the facts um on a fact sheet regarding the information that this um, of what space tourism is going to do for Las Cruces and our region, so we we will be uh, getting that out uh, here fairly quickly. Sounds great. <clears throat> Remember, Councilor Sword, years ago when we talked about um, you know the what we wanted Las Cruces to look like when it came to space. I still remember that conversation. Oh yes, I remember well too. Uh, my first interview with the staff as a new city councilor 
was one of the things I mentioned. I said, I look forward to that launch. Finally, it's coming. I almost missed it. Yeah. So 6.30, huh, Rochelle? 6.30 a.m. the doors will, will be open. Yes. And we'll, like I said, we'll be providing quite a bit of information here in the next few hours, actually. At, at their city hall. City Hall and the Rio Grande Theater. You gonna pull out the popcorn machine? No, <laughs> no popcorn, but pastries and burritos. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay, um, Mayor Pro Tem. That was quick, Mayor. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a downtown um, update um, from Chris as, as you know that I meet with him once a month um, to discuss all the activities happening in the downtown. Um, lots of things going on and really excited to hear. Um, the parking lot behind COES has been redone, so that's nice. We will be looking at redoing parking lot seven. Um, and it'll be, um, they'll be starting July 6th. Um, it'll be a 90 day build out. Um, phase one will be reconfiguring parking lot, relocating the trash bin, those things. Um, and it probably not till the second phase will those bathrooms be um, redone. Um, we also meet a lot, um, not only with Chris, the, um, the, the new downtown coordinator, I hope I'm not um, um, speaking out of line, um, but he, and maybe I might be, so sorry, um, but um, we also meet with um, LCPD and LCPD has been doing quite a bit of work in, in the area. You know, we've had um, numerous noise um, complaints in the area up and down the historic Mesquite Historic District onto the downtown and Alameda um, Historic District. So they've been doing, um, you know, small projects out there, identifying who the speeders are. Um, and 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 just doing a lot of a lot of work. Um, one of our bigger um, or uh, more intense conversations have been um, with Rad opening up. Mayor, you and I got a, a meeting um, uh, email um, from the owners there, and so there was a lot of conversation about safety and organizing um, there, making sure that we have proper lighting, because if you recall in the past, there have been concerns, you know, when folks are walking out late um, to include, um, you know, workers that are two o'clock in the morning trying to get to their vehicles and such. So I, I think we have an, a, a good plan. Um, and, and we talked a lot about digital um, signs, um, because there's been some racing down the the, the downtown, uh, we've talked about that that one apparatus that we've had um, at Apalaka Park and Young Park. Um, they only have a few, so Mayor, we talked about um, maybe um, downtown purchasing one to have just specifically for the area. Um, it is a good deterrent for folks. Um, and so um, National Night Out was discussed. That will be August 7th. Mark your calendar. Um, there will be an, a kids expo uh, also on August 7th. So real exciting stuff. Um, we talked about um, the celebration on July 2nd um, with in Councilor Vasquez's area. I, I think, I hope he speaks to that. Um, it sounded like a, a great event um, to sort of tie up all the awesome things that um, LCPD is doing there, creating community. So thank you to LCPD and um, um, Councilor Vasquez. Um, we have talked about um, sort of, um, it, I don't know if you all knew, but the artwork there in La, La, La in La Callecita has was damaged, and so we're, we've been working with the artists. They've removed all that area. We had to lo re we had to find a location large enough for him to redo that artwork. I believe everything has been removed, and that is getting back to um, 
um, its original form, um, but it'll take some time. Um, let's see, um, lots of discussion about um, the arts and cultural district and the wayfinding sign, the design work, design work that will need to be accomplished for these get, um, gateway signs. So really exciting. We'll be seeing um, a lot of the the capital outlay funding used specifically for that that gateway signage that I think is going to be really important. Identifying the historic districts, the ACD, the downtown. Um, and such. Um, there's been a, a work on a traffic study, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, a lighting study, um, and that's that's going back and forth from the consultants to traffic, um, and so th that's where some other um, funding will be used, capital outlay funding identified by ACD from the state. Uh, I, I, and Mayor, we talked a lot about the parking committee. Um, Chris and I, we've had a couple of, of maybe a little more than just a couple of times that we haven't reached quorum. Um, and we've done a lot of our work um, related to this parking committee um, and, and just waiting for some things to, to happen. And I'm not sure if it's because we've been meeting via Zoom that that's been difficult for some folks. But um, Chris and I talked about sending out a survey, how, um, you know, in regards to how regularly folks want to meet um, and, and making sure that that we we have one vacant position there and Christine could probably tell us um, which one that is. Um, we know that there's important stakeholders and people want to not only talk about parking, but all the things having to do with the downtown. So we have some great ideas about not only convening when the parking committee needs to convene, but also um, convening um, stakeholder meetings just to inform the, the public, um, the businesses there and those folks that are interested in, in the downtown. Um, and then I always get to see a preview of the TID um, and you guys are, are gonna be really excited that staff have done a lot of work and it'll be presented soon to us. Um, and Mayor, I think some there's some really exciting things coming um, up with a feasibility study for the downtown housing. Those things are, are really, really exciting. And I hope that you've had opportunity if you haven't. I believe myself, Councilor Vasquez and Councilor Bencomo um, sat in a sort of kickoff event. Um, let's see, lots of, lots of information there. Um, and then finally, Mayor, um, we met with our um, Animal Services Board. Um, it was a, a really good meeting, but some of the, the, the things that have been identified is, you know, working on um, uh, a spade and neuter campaign, um, our TNR um, program, um, in, increasing education, um, so that we become more responsible pet owners. Um, and, and those are things that I, I think we had a, a great conversation uh, about, and I had a, a continued conversation in facilities meeting with um, Clint. Um, Mayor, I'm hearing some of the information regarding um, disillusionment of the joint powers of agreement with the county. Um, I've heard it more now from several people and I'm, I'm asking that if those things are happening that we are able to have a, a meeting to discuss that um, and, and so that you know we're we're on on top of that and and sort of on the same page it's difficult when community comes to you as a board of directors and has these sort of major feelings about it and you're not sure what that what that looks like. So I think staff might be working on some of that. That doesn't get filled back to council. And so I'm asking that we have a work session very specifically. Now, I, I think we've had those discussions maybe two council, council um, ago. And, and I think it behooves us to, to sort of get updated and, and understand where staff is at with those conversations. And with that, Mayor, I turn, that, turn it back um, over to you. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I haven't had any discussions with the county in, oh gosh, in at least a year uh, back when, you know, we were having little challenges and then things seemed to kind of slow down or, or work themselves out. Um, last I recall, former assistant manager David Dolahan had a plan that um, was going to charge uh, county animals uh, if we were to go solo. So um, I think is Eric now the person who took over for, for okay, so I don't know. Yes, you, yes, sir. Yes. Eric is. Yeah, I, like I said, I haven't heard anything. And last I talked with Fernando, the county manager, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't any big interest. I mean, way back then, you know, I don't know if anything's changed. So. I appreciate that, Mayor. I've just heard it now from several key players that I think um, it makes, it gives me pause. Uh, not that I'm against it, but I think um, to be fair, we should hear about what's happening. Um, and it'd be helpful to have a, a meeting to discuss that further. Yeah, I, I had heard that they the county was going to have their own uh, animal services, and I, right. I don't think so. And it was a little bit pretty expensive. Well, they're they're moving in that direction. I mean, when we've had meetings, Mayor, to be frank, um, there's there's a lot of discussion and um, um, around that um, specifically with County Manager Macias moving into their own spade and neuter programming, updating the facility up at the up up, the, up at the fairgrounds, and and I just think it, it, we should just have a, a very robust you know transparent conversation about that. So we're all ready, and we have a deeper understanding about what our role and responsibility is going to be moving forward. Oh wow! Okay, well if they if they want to go in that direction, I, I have no problem either way. So. Okay, I'll, I'll reach out to them. We'll set, set thank something. you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Flores. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I too had that on my, uh, on my list of announcements or comments or things I want to share, report. Um, the, um, the discussion came up in our last um, Animal Service Center uh, board meeting um, because of the um, the anticipated and long awaited, um, soon to come, I hope, uh, ordinance regarding TNR. And the TNR ordinance will only affect the, um, the city and the, the, the city owners and, and the animals, uh, strays, I suppose, uh, who are found within city limits. So um, the TNR, and there, there has been, um, been, there have been meetings. Um, and uh, it just, it's not officially part, and I say officially because Chair Gandara, um, or Mayor Putin Gandara is a chair of the Animal Task Force Committee, and there's the Animal Ordinance Committee, which met um, for several years, more, more than two years before the ordinance was finally, um, before it was finalized. Um, so now uh, we find ourselves with this ordinance that is soon to come. And um, over the weekend, there was some communication with uh, constituents who uh, have been uh, residents who have been active on this pre-formation committee uh, being told that there's going to be a dog ordinance, uh, some provisions changed in the animal ordinance that includes dogs regarding the dog park. Now, my request at this time to the city attorney and um, the deputy city, city attorney, both Jennifer Vega Brown and Robert Cabello, is that please, if you're going to uh, have an ordinance change, uh, you know, in section seven of the municipal code, um, delay the animal, delay the dog, uh, please delay the, the dog ordinance uh, for later. Um, and let's pass, let's get that uh, ordinance before this body to um, act on our resolution. People are waiting. Um, I'm hearing from many community members that are, um, it's, it's an outcry and uh, there's confusion. So I, I just want to put that out there. I don't want to in any way um, in, discourage um, our hardworking community members who worked so, 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 so very hard over the years to get a comprehensive TNR uh, ordinance. 
Um, and I find it, uh, well, I'll reserve my own comments, but I, I just uh, make that big ask of a city attorney and deputy city attorney um, and the powers that be at city. And I want to also convey at this time to our listeners, to our residents, to uh, people who view and follow our meetings, uh, we city councilors make decisions but there, a lot of them are based, yes, on our policy making efforts, uh, but a lot of them um, in so far as scheduling and that sort of stuff is really outside of our reach many times. So I just wanna make that clear and that residents are not being ignored when certain uh, requests are being made. Um, so that being said, uh, Mr. Mayor, I really hope uh, that our city attorney um, and uh, Deputy City Attorney uh, uh, listen to this and the acting city manager at this time, Mr. Connie Tamopeo, um, you, know, you know, pay heed to what my request has been at this time on that. Um, so I, um, yeah, a lot of things happened this weekend around our little animal world. But um, the other thing I failed to mention at the, um, at the last uh, announcement type thing uh, was the ceremony at what is now the Oregon Mountain High School, previously known as Onyate High School. Um, it, it was really interesting to see that we had, I think we had one, I thought there were two female uh, new uh, graduates. It turned out that one of them um, it was not a woman. At Guadalupe, the officer by the first name of Guadalupe, that name is for men and women in the Mexican culture. Um, so, uh, but at any rate, there were only eight graduates and, um, and it was good to see um, how they train. Um, I think that some of the training uh, that, that was shown was not um, the best that could have been shown. Um, and, um, but the singing by um, Cruz um, from, from Robert Cruz uh, from our economic development was quite beautiful. And, um, and the words by Judge Conrad Bidea were quite beautiful before he swore them in. And, um, and to see a lot of officers graduating very young uh, with their families going up, their parents going up to walk with them as they graduate um, was was really heart wrenching, knowing that they will be facing very difficult times in their lives, and um, literally putting their lives literally putting their lives on the line for our community. So I want to thank uh, our police department and congratulate our new um, officers. Um, I also wanted to uh, again um, let me go on to my little list here. Oh, um, I want to remind our constituents, our residents, um, that if you have any questions regarding uh, status, and I, and I put a plea out to our either communications department or IT department, uh, we get calls and emails from our residents saying that they weren't able to access something, that it wasn't accessible, something wasn't working. But we ne I nevertheless encourage you to go to lascruces.civicweb.net if you have a concern, a 311 concern like potholes and trash, um, please go to https colon uh, backslash backslash www.las-cruces.org slash 311 and then in capital letters ask hyphen las cruces and um and that method is uh, more effective because it goes directly to the appropriate department it's attached a number is assigned to it i mean not attached but assigned and uh then the city personnel is able to approach each one as time permits i know that some some uh, people think that things are really really urgent so they do contact us uh, individually the city councilors or call the departments but that's what i recommend and if you, of course never fail to get in touch with us also um i always want i also want to uh, remind people that the senior centers have opened up uh, for meals 
Not all of them are open. Uh, the, um, the ones that are open um, are, let's see off the top of my head, definitely Mesquite. Uh, then there, uh, the, the, excuse me, Munson Center on Mesquite. And then the ones that aren't open are still uh, distributing the grab and go meals. And these centers, the ones that are open in the grab, grab and go meals are from 11 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. Um, and for those of you who, who live in those respective areas or uh, attend to those, uh, you will see that, uh, that information posted. Um, I also want to comment on um, the parade on July 3rd. Um, the parade, it was just absolutely wonderful to see um, just uh, oceans and oceans of people. And um, people were so happy. It was, it was just utterly joyful to see people so happy and um, children with, you know, funny, sun those funny glasses and little flags and balloons and people actually having tailgates, um, you know, sort of like a tailgate party in certain streets where they were backed into a parking lot. Um, so that was absolutely wonderful and joyful. And, um, and, and as I looked at this ocean of people, you know, of the sea of humanity, I just thought, um, I just thought about our responsibility as a city council, as city government, to really make sure that those babies, so there were some babies that looked maybe as young as, you know, maybe a week old or something, um, that we fulfill that promise that they're owed, you know, a good life, um, good environment, good education, and may they never go hungry. Um, the other, uh, the other issue I want to address is the tennis courts. And you, you did announce it, uh, you did address it, Mr. Mayor. But I, I do want to say that um, uh, our acting city manager, Ikani Tamopeo, sent a fantastic letter to me explaining exactly everything um, that has transpired. Um, and I forwarded that letter to, uh, to, to he, actually he wrote, perdón, he, excuse me, he wrote the letter to the president of the tennis, our local tennis association. And unfortunately, uh, some people are still contacting us. And so I, I don't have the gentleman's name, but I did uh, receive a letter from Ed Frank and from uh, Martin uh, Mays. And I did forward uh, Ikani's, uh, Mr. Tamopeo's uh, letter to them with a full explanation as to the temporary use of pickleball uh, playing at Lions Park and how that's going to um, change. Um, so I think, I think that's it for, oh, I know. Um, I didn't report on SERTD last time and that's the South Central Rapid Transit District and um, as you all know, uh, Sharon Thomas worked very, very hard uh, for many years to make sure that that, uh, that dream become a reality. And it's headed by David Armijo, who's done a fantastic job. And, um, and I, I did report at one time that um, our, the, the, uh, the state of New Mexico has been uh, providing transportation that the state of Texas has, has, was supposed to provide. So we necessarily uh, expected, it's called section 5703 of the federal DOT and you know, whatever agreement that is, but, um, but it is an agreement and it is an understanding that those funds are to come to, to New Mexico and specifically to our SERTD and it's it's boku bucks it's 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 a sizable amount of money but for some reason so mr mayor if you have any leverage with mr leaser i mean i did tell him that all my cousins voted for him um and uh, they're not releasing that money so uh, javier uh, perea who's the mayor of sunland park and chair of the um serTD board uh sent a a dynamite letter uh, to the appropriate parties, the feds, and um, there's sp still been no answer on that. Um, and there's been an expansion of, of uh, transportation and, um, 
and uh, with this money, we can continue to provide that transportation or SERTD uh, can continue and expand even further because what David has done has, uh, or Mijo has really brought um, the, um, uh, you know, Alamogordo, Hatch, uh, Doña Ana, different parts, Anthony, um, Sunland Park and, and El Paso um, together. So, um, so Mr. Mayor, that's my ask. And, uh, and that's the end of my report. And thank you very much. Can you drop me an email, Councillor, and I'll, I'll reach out to, to Mayor Elisa, see what Great. we can do. I will. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just to kind of, uh, along the lines that you were talking about, which senior centers are opening. So yeah. they're all from 11 o'clock to 1230. So you were right about Munson, which is Munson Center, which is at 975 South Mesquite. Eastside Community also is going to have in, in uh, di concrete dining, 310 North Tornillo, Henry, Henry Benavides Center, 1045 McClure. For those who wish to still get their grab and go meals, those will be available at the Sage Cafe, 6121 Reynolds Drive, and the uh, Frank O'Brien Pavement Center, 304 West Bell. Great. Okay. okay. And uh, Councilor Bencomo. And just skip me, Mr. Oh, Mayor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Councilor Sorg, I apologize. I just have a few little things to mention here real quick. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for uh, uh, for all the rain we've gotten in the last eight, nine days. You're welcome. Did my uh, best. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, I don't know what you were thinking. You sound like you're thanking me, so I just that's no problem. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you for the rain, just Mr. Mayor. Take some credit. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the at least we didn't get, get, get downpour like El Paso. Wow. I, they, I said, at least they didn't get pummeled like El Paso did. I mean, yeah, they shut down the freeway a couple sure. times. Mm -hmm. Right. They, they have poor drainage designs, though. Um, Fourth of July party on Sunday night uh, was spectacular. The Gin Blossoms were a good band to have. I hear the bands of the 90s are coming back more popular now. Uh, it was a good show, and uh, I happened to leave just before you got there, Mayor, so uh, we missed each other. I wanted to get an early start on the traffic jam. My gosh, there was a lot of cars there. Um, and uh, then I also wanted to mention that last month in June, I don't remember when exactly, some of us might have missed this, the National Broadcasting Company News uh, has a state tracker for covid uh, 19, and um, it reported that New Mexico had the highest vaccination rates in the U.S. per capita. So congratulations to everybody in the state, everybody in the county, everybody here in the city that worked on this awesome job. Uh, I was so pleased to see those high numbers of vaccinations uh, uh, in the city here in the county and the state, of course. So those are three real quick things. Oh, one more thing. Um, my first in-person meeting uh, was held this morning with the uh, Transportation Sustainability and Infrastructure PRC. We met in persons and it was awesome. Uh, we're a little, I was a little um, uh, rusty, I think is the word, on meeting in person, but we did a job and a lot of things were accomplished. Um, more of that will be coming in future uh, meetings ahead. And then to add to your um, uh, 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 comments, Mr. Mayor, on the um, on this uh, spaceport and Virgin Galactic. Um, Virgin Galactic has a countdown to their launch on Sunday, and it stands right now at eight, nine days, four, 14 hours, 21 minutes, and 36 seconds. And so that's we'll follow that as it goes through the week here, and then uh, Spaceport America they have reported, I want to get the exact language right here, uh, in their release here, that news information release that they give, that according to industry estimates, the suborbital orbital space tour to tourism market could be worth $8 billion by 2030. So this is nothing small, no small potatoes here. So I just, that, um, oh, and one last thing. Uh, we had a few members of our council on the 
a judging of our floats on Saturday night. I'm looking forward to hearing the results of that. Maybe that could be said now. Okay. They're, they're in today's newspaper, Councilor Sword. Oh, I haven't read it yet. Thank you. So, Councilor Sorg, um, clarify how many days you said towards for the countdown? I thought you said nine days. Shouldn't it be like five days? That's what they have. Nine days, 14 hours, and 21 minutes. When, okay. Is there like a website that you're looking at? Uh, this comes from their um, updates that they send out to anybody who wants it. Uh, I don't know how you get on their mailing list. It's an email. Okay. Well, and it's on their website, of course, too. All right. Well, we'll check it out. Okay. Well, thanks. Okay. Um, Councilor Bencomo. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I, yeah, I have a couple things on my list. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. I wanted to, of course, thank um, staff, Parks and Rec facilities, LCPD, everybody who participated in the events this weekend. Um, and of course, especially to everyone at, um, that had something to do with the parade. Um, I was very happy and honored to be one of the judges for the parade alongside Councillor Beta Stuvi, and we missed Mayor Pro Tem Gandara, um, but it was great that we had park staff there to fill in. Um, honestly, it was a lot of fun. I just being in community like that was really incredible, and um, and I know it must have taken a lot of work, and um, it it turned out incredible. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone um, who took part in that. And of course, thank you to everyone who came and to all the entries in the parade, um, whether you won a prize or not, it was honestly really incredible to see people excited um, to be part of something like that and um, just so joyful. So it was really incredible. So many, many thanks to staff. Um, and it was, I was also really great. We got to meet um, ACM Tama Powell's family. So that was really wonderful to get to meet some of them and um, wish them well in their transition to a beautiful city. Um, I wanted to also give a brief update on Jardín de los Niños. Uh, Councillor Vasquez and I um, uh, met with their um, Flourishing Families Parent Mentoring Program a couple weeks ago. To be honest with you, it's one of my, it's been one of my favorite community meetings since being on the council. Um, being with parents um, that participate in Jardín de los Niños services. Um, and basically, him and I just had a listening session and some really incredible things came out of that conversation with um, some directly impacted people in our community regarding poverty and, and, and housing insecurity. Um, and, but they had a lot of things to say about what could make our communities better. They raised the issue of, of rising crime in their neighborhoods and how we can address that the issue of lack of youth activities in our city and, um, and wanting to see more things for younger kids. Um, they raise the issue of supporting infant mental health, which, um, you know, I brought obviously the, the importance of having two social workers on the council is pretty incredible um, and certainly a priority for, for council. Um, someone also raised the issue of a cooling station at Community of Hope and that there was not one. Um, Councilor Vasquez reached out to the staff literally the next day and pretty immediately one was implemented at Community of Hope. Um, and thank you to staff for that because honestly it was like the quickest turnaround on an ask ever. And um, it was just really efficient and such an important, honestly a little thing that um, potentially could save lives. Um, that actually goes a really long way. So we were very thankful for the folks who brought that up. Um, also folks raised, honestly, one of the things that stuck with me the most was um, a mom, um, a parent in the, in the group raised um, how difficult it is to access affordable childcare. Um, in her experience, you know, she was trying to get her GED. Um, she was working a couple of jobs. She has a couple kids and uh, finding childcare really was a huge barrier for her finishing her GED. And to me, this is, this is why I'm advocating so hard for something like guaranteed basic income, because we just don't know what the barriers are for some families, for some parents, um, and that a little stabilizing force could actually go an incredibly long way for a family like hers. And so um, it was just, you know, a, a beautiful place to, um, 
a space to be for people to raise these issues. And the last thing people raised was um, just more support for homeowners to rehab their homes. And so we just had such a great, powerful conversation. And I hope to keep doing those kinds of conversations, those kind of listening sessions with um, certainly Jardín de los Niños, but other organizations, because it was, again, really, really powerful. And it, it, it surfaced out a lot of really important issues. Um, the last thing I wanted to add, Mayor, um, actually, because it's present on my mind, um, obviously, I would have talked about it two weeks from now, but because of council changing to Tuesday, our Transportation Sustainability and Infrastructure Committee met this morning. Um, yes, in person is our first time in person as a committee, I'm pretty sure. I don't think we ever met last year as in person. Anyway, we discussed uh, several things that I'm very excited to bring back to council soon. But one of the things that we discussed in particular was um, some of the barriers and challenges in order for us to get to a fair, free public transit system. And one of them was that um, the public transportation department is currently having a hard time hiring bus drivers, specifically for dial-a-ride. And one of the issues that came up is the pay. What bus drivers earn at the city is incredibly low, I would say shamefully low. Um, and so I think that if we're talking of, I support um, very much uh, wage, better wages for LC, LCPD officers. I believe in a living wage. I believe in hard, fair pay for hard work. Um, and I think that should be addressed at a city-wide level. I have raised this issue to our city manager, Peely, um, but I really believe there needs to be a pay study conducted and those places, those departments, it doesn't matter if you're patrolling the streets as an officer, if you're driving the streets as a bus driver, or if you're filling in potholes at the city, any employee at the city of Las Cruces should not be making poverty wages. And I would argue that $11 is that for bus drivers. And so I really want to challenge us to look at what, um, uh, how we pay the employees at the city of Las Cruces um, and really be a model for the rest of the city. So that's, that's, those are my comments, Mayor. Um, excuse me, thank you so much. Oh, and apologies for not being with you all. Last week I was at home visiting, um, sorry, I was in Colorado visiting my family and. Um, just didn't get a chance to hop on with you all. But I'll be checking out the recording to make sure I um, check in on the pedestrian issue. So thank you, Mayor. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Yes, Mayor, yes, could I yes could Councilor. Make a quick comment. I want to thank Councilor Bencomo. That is something I wanted to bring up to the pay for our drivers for dial ride and the bus drivers too. Um, it is very low. We need to change that. Okay, yeah, very good. Uh, Councilor Vasquez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and just, I'll just start by saying yes, I agree with the review um, of the, that pay scale for those folks. That's a critically important um, job and, and function of the city. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, also, uh, another round of congratulations to staff um, for putting on uh, just an amazing um, set of festivities and a, another great parade. Um, uh, all I've heard is nothing but positive reviews. Um, and I think folks just really expressed um, how joyful they are to be out in public and celebrating with their neighbors and being a, a community that gets to interact with each other in person. Again, um, I, I just keep hearing great things. And so I know staff puts a lot of time and sacrifices their holiday in many ways to make that happen. So thank you. Thank you to staff. Um, we've got a couple of things that are coming up that are really important. Uh, one is, um, we will be having a work session um, on the cannabis legalization and uh, what potential regulations the city may want to um, in the near future. And that's really important. We, we I think, have to match the state's timeline um, uh, of when uh, businesses can be licensed or at least they can begin submitting applications for licenses in September. Um, so um, Assistant City Manager Tamo Bell is working hard to both solicit public input um, and get some meetings uh, through some PRCs, um, Quality of Life and Economic Development, before that issue comes before the work uh, bef uh, to, to council for a work session. Um, and so I'm excited that we're moving the ball on that. And I want to thank staff because I know I've raised this issue several times um, to, to seize this e economic opportunity. Uh, this industry is going to create uh, hundreds, if not thousands of jobs here. And so, you know, we can, I say, say that we can't miss the ball on this. And I, and I thank staff for recognizing that. Um, so I'll be looking forward to that. 
Um, another good economic development um, tool that just came into effect um, that I know Councilman Como is also looking at is the new rules around uh, alcohol regulation and the sale of alcohol um, at our local restaurants. Um, the, uh, essentially, those uh, those new changes have, have gone into law um, with uh, the start of the new um, fiscal year for the state. And so uh, I'm not sure how that's going to work in terms of um, us approving individual licenses for new establishments that um, choose to, to carry uh, full liquor licenses. Um, but, but that is a tool that's now available to small restaurants. Uh, what used to cost, what used to cost, uh, you know, three quarters of a million dollars, a very prohibitive, obviously, uh, cost, uh, you know, potentially cost a restaurant now three to four thousand dollars. That is a huge, huge change. And what was a barrier to um, entry into this market is now highly accessible. And so that just means that they'll, um, our local mom and pop restaurants will be more competitive with the likes of the big franchise uh, restaurants that can afford um, those types of licenses. And I think that gives our folks, our local business people, a huge economic opportunity, um, not advantage and an, oppor an opportunity, right? And, and I think that's what we've been advocating for um, with the change of liquor, um, liquor laws for so long on the council. So two great things that, that have come out um, that I think are gonna make our community more prosperous and help build wealth. Um, we have our last El Paseo ad hoc committee meeting later this year, I mean, later this month, and, and we'll have um, a set of recommendations that will be approved by the committee uh, that will start making their way through PRCs as well. Uh, my hope is that we can get some, uh, some policy changes in the form um, of resolutions and ordinances. I, I won't speak too soon because we still have to agree as a meeting on what those are. Decided that we will be bringing forth um, some policy recommendations that I'm, I'm hoping we can vote on before the end of the year that will help spur the development of the El Paseo and Solano corridor in a real way. Um, and that's going to have to be matched with investments as well from the city, I believe, and I'm excited uh, to bring those forth to, to the council. Um, lastly, I uh, just want to address the issues at Young Pond uh, have been unfortunately pervasive and, um, and have really set us back several times uh, with uh, a bunch of different um, changing conditions uh, at the pond. Uh, and I have stayed on top of it with staff and staff has done everything, I think up to this point that they can to ensure that the fish mortality is kept to a minimum. Um, obviously losing our, our oxygen uh, oxygenation system um, is really the, that's the foundation of um, creating the type of environment where fish can live. And so I think we kind of had a domino effect of some different issues related to trying to mitigate that circ that um, uh, the circumstances there. But I know that uh, staff is working hard on it. Um, as far as I know, um, not very little to no fish um, have, have died uh, since we've gone into kind of emergency mitigation measures uh, that includes pumping and reading pH meters and reading um, oxygen levels uh, several times through the day. We have staff going out to the pond at 10 o'clock every night, um, both checking levels, but also kind of injecting that last bit of oxygen so that we don't have those mortality levels in the morning. So they're going above and beyond to make sure that, that we can mitigate that before we reach a permanent solution uh, with, with two diffusers that are coming, um, uh, hopefully coming here very soon. And uh, to me, that's just kind of uh, reiterates the, the need to reevaluate uh, just the, the construction of this pond as a whole and the need to perhaps go to a natural pond setting. Um, I mentioned that communities like Deming, um, like Roswell, like Hobbs, uh, don't seem to have any issues with their naturally built ponds. Um, in fact, Deming just, I mean, they, they're seeing, I don't know, hundreds of families every weekend go out there and fish and um, it, it's honestly a much better experience anyway, not to have a concrete line pond, I think, just for nature's sake. But um, uh, that's a discussion, I think, for, for the future. Um, perhaps the next city councilor in my seat will champion that or choose to take that issue on because I know this uh, will take time, but there is money available from the federal government uh, through the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, that funds exactly these types of projects. And in fact, the Land and Water Conservation Fund um, has for um, municipal park projects just like ours. And so that may be a source of revenue to really start looking at um, how we keep this treasure going. Uh, one of the first places I went fishing uh, in my life and 
I treasure it for that. And I know that our kids do too. So I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Beta Stubi. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you to my colleagues who have given reports um, for a few of the committees that I serve on too. So you make my job pretty easy here. Um, first off, I'd like to address the ASCMV. I know we talked about a lot of issues, but one more that I'd like to just bring up is the increasing um, population at the center. Uh, we are seeing every day um, lots of dogs being turned in. Um, we have seen a change in the types of animals that we can take back in. Um, there was limitations during the emergency health orders um, to keep the population down, um, to keep staffing down. Um, it was very helpful for the population to have um, a good health, uh, but now that we've changed, um, we have you know, about 600 animals already back at the center and quality of care is becoming very critical at this point. And so there's a lot I think that needs to be done in the community as far as um, responsible ownership, um, different types of tools and tricks. If you do see a lost dog on how to try to walk it around its uh, neighborhood to try to return it and see what we can do as a community to avoid having animals be taken into the shelter. Um, then I did attend uh, the Mavita end of the year update um, which was very interesting and good to see um, that the different types of uh, challenges over the last year that they had um, were met with innovation. Um, and actually, um, Avita reported that they had uh, more uh, actual outreaches through technology than that, um, with the use of technology to make those outreaches than they have had um, in previous years. And so I think um, it was really great to have city staff there and other community partners to see what we can do with economic development within our community. I would like to thank our Parks and Rec and all the city staff that participated in all the events over the weekend. I'm sure as everybody's reported, it's been absolutely fantastic to see everybody out and about. Um, it was a pleasure to join Councillor Bencomo as a judge for the electric light parade. Um, and for you, Councillor Soar, our best overall winner was the Potter's House Christian Center. Um, they had a full lit um, float, which in a light parade, you know, that's really important. They stayed true to uh, the theme and originality, and they had a bonus where they shot confetti off right in front of the judges station. <laughs> so all those elements really put them in number one. So it was wonderful to see. Our first place winner for commercial float was Hernandez Plumbing, Heating and Cooling, and our first place winner for non-commercial float was the uh, Marine Corps League, El Perro Diablo uh, DT478. And that full list can be seen. Um, I know that we put out PIOs and the Las Cruces Sun News has picked it up as well. So thank you so much to all the participants, all the families that came out, everybody to make it such a wonderful community event and to kind of bring back um, hope and light, I think, in the community. Um, then I would like to say, um, as uh, Councillor Vasquez mentioned, um, our PRCs are going to be seeing um, some of these uh, public input and changes with the, the cannabis legislation. So there will be a special quali quality of life PRC meeting um, a little bit earlier this month, just so that we can make sure we can get in that before the work session and can go over details. So um, please look out for extra communications that will come through. And that's about it for me. So thank you, Mayor. You're on mute, sir. Sorry about that. So Ikani is um, filling in for IFO, who's taking his mandatory two-week um, time off. So I told IFO he can call in. He's just not supposed to show up at City Hall for any reason. So. You know, I don't want him coming at midnight, you know, going and getting something from his office or something like that. Okay, Connie, you're the, you're, 
you're on. All right. Thank you, Mayor Miyagashima and City Council. Greetings to you all. Uh, Ikani Tomogel, Assistant City Manager. As Mayor said, I'm filling in for Ifo Pili. Uh, and those are big, very big shoes to fill, um, literally. So just to, there's a few uh, things that, that I wanted to share that would be meaningful to City Council. Uh, number one, uh, kudos to the finance and budgeting team. Uh, you may have heard already, but if not, our Moody's rating for GeoBond has uh, improved. Uh, we had AA rating uh, with a negative outlook uh, prior, and it was just announced by Moody's rating that that negative outlook was removed uh, based on state pension reform and improved unreserved fund balances. So kudos to the finance and budgeting team for making that happen. Um, additionally, from quality of life, uh, museums uh, are now open. And they were open since last week, starting from June 28th. This past week, the first three days, we had a spike, uh, probably one of the higher, uh, higher times that we have seen in the museum. 234 visitors visited the museum, uh, which, uh, which are high numbers for three days. And 10 of those, interesting enough, was by the Peely family. So we are trying to stack our numbers. So if you have a family of 10, feel free to come by and visit our museums because we are taking, uh, taking our statistics down. So that's always fun. Uh, Parks and, and Rec, we have an announcement. Um, as, as you can all imagine, uh, the electric light parade on the third and fourth, uh, you all have hit on how amazing and fantastic that was. Um, as somebody who's been here for only a few months, uh, it was uh, my desire and, and dream to be part of the community and to be there with my family. And they enjoyed it more than I did. My, my little kiddos, uh, they loved the sound and everything. So super amazing. But let me just share some, um, some interesting statistics. Uh, for the Electric Light Parade uh, 2019, we had about 125 vehicles entered. Uh, that was pre-pandemic. Uh, just this past weekend, uh, we had 250 vehicles entered. So definitely a lot of uh, pent up energy from our community, very excited. And just some background information, there wasn't much time for the electric light parade to actually happen. Uh, this electric light parade, as, as you remember, things were shut down and then they weren't. Um, and then there was this anticipation, but there were only uh, about a month, month and a half uh, maybe two months at the most, and this wasn't this wasn't supposed to happen just because the fourth the fireworks and the concert is a huge event on its own in two months to plan, but they took this they shouldered this uh, Parks and, and Rec they're known for their resiliency and dedication creativity and innovation and they um, uh, you know no surprise to anyone did a fantastic so kudos to Phil Catnatch uh, and the team to uh, Franco, to uh, Robert, and to Sonia, and to all the teams. Obviously, it's a huge department, but all the supporting services as law enforcement as well, and to, of course, our lovely judges um, on the parade. So uh, just to uh, wrap up, we had nearly about 200 kids. We have summer programs happening right now. Our youth summer program, session one just finished. Uh, again, 200 kids in our uh, that have joined and our session two is beginning starting July 6th to July 30th. Uh, kudos to Summer Recreation. We didn't see it in Teen Connection for running those programs. Uh, right now in Parks and Rec, we have 36 summer youth interns. Uh, that That is, uh, is a blessing and also uh, is taking some time for our, our teams and our crews to, uh, to be mentors to these um, these interns, but I, but these are youth interns that uh, really takes time, dedication to make sure that they're mentored the right way. So I just wanted to give kudos to Parks and Rec again for taking 36 summer youth interns um, and, and giving jobs to those youth who are looking uh, for jobs this summer. And um, on last but not least with Parks and Rec, keep Las Cruces beautiful, just an update for District 5 Council Member Sorg's uh, area. On June 26th, they had a team up to clean up and had about 41 volunteers and a total of about 3.1 tons of trash was collected. Um, I just wanna end just to give everyone a, a heads up, uh, especially uh, Mayor Miyagashima and council. It has been mentioned that we'll be coming in 
uh, to PRC for cannabis. And as I mentioned, uh, we have a very aggressive timeline that we're trying to hit. But more important to us is making sure the community hears, they get to engage with cannabis. This is a very sensitive topic in any part of the spectrum. Uh, but we want uh, we want to make sure to, to touch the public as, as much as we can. So we'll come to PRCs twice this month to economic development and quality of life. We plan to have a town hall meeting on July 22nd this month for the community uh, so that we can hear them. Um, July 26th, we'll come to you, council, at a work session, and then we'll go to PNZ on July 27th. And then we'll have our last town hall meeting with the community on August 12th, more of a um, we've heard you type meeting, we've engaged with you, and here we are with what we're, uh, what we've heard from the community, what we've heard from PRC, kind of a, a finale of our community engagement. And then we'll come to full council in a regular council session around August 16th. Um, and then we'll, we'll, that, that will just be for consideration. Um, and then we will use the following, um, the following council meeting September 7th, uh, or if we need another council meeting September 20th. And that will hopefully align maybe uh, uh, a little late of where we need to be about September 1st, but it'll hopefully be in September where we want to have this all passed. Um, uh, of course, at, at the recommendation and the guidance and direction of city council, but at least we wanna make sure that we're presenting as staff um, giving you direction. Um, in addition to all of that, we are planning and preparing a cannabis survey right now that uh, will be uh, released to the community. And so again, to that end of trying to reach out to uh, your constituents, to our community and make sure that everybody has a say um, to give you the information that you need. And so Mayor Miyagishima, that is it. Council, thank you for the, uh, thank you for your time and I'll give it back to you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Connie. From what I can tell from various cities around uh, New Mexico, as well as outside of New Mexico, the two main issues regarding cannabis is where will it be sold? and the time hours of operation. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, before we close, uh, I was, it was requested, uh, as you all know, our, in about two weeks, we're gonna have our first live meeting there at council chambers. And I was asked if we could look into requiring proof of vaccination only in council chambers during council meeting. And so I, uh, asked uh, Jennifer if she could look into that. And I think she's prepared to give us her opinion on that. Um, so take it away, Jennifer. Good morning. I mean, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, thank you. There was a case that recently um, came out it's just last week. Uh, it's called Pertle versus the Legislative Council in that the New Mexico Supreme Court found that the state legislature was not in violation of um, article, I believe article four, section 12 of the New Mexico constitution by limiting access to legislative chambers um, during the pandemic. Um, the, the Supreme Court noted that the abil ability of the legislature to live stream and be available online exceeded the New Mexico constitutional requirements. Our constitution is unclear on whether or not in person is required versus live. So they ruled in the favor of um, live for in this situation. I'm not sure how that would, uh, moving forward, how that looks. I think that as long as we are compliant with the Open Meetings Act, which requires um, live. It actually, we would also exceed because we, we allow live streaming as well. Um, I've had a very spirited conversation with a fellow attorney who may or may not disagree with me, but um, I'll continue looking into that. I think that as long as we are compliant with the OMA, we'd be okay. Okay, so do I need to have a resolution of sorts, or is it uh, something there that uh, be, that's just one of the requirements that, that, that I could call based on the fact that I run the meeting in, in city council chambers? And that is that they would need to show proof of either a vaccination card or some type of receipt, because I, I believe some of our neighbors, uh, some of our re residents who, who have been vaccinated in El Paso, they, get, they don't get a card. They get something, they get a type of a receipt showing that they have uh, received their 
vaccination. So something that I think is credible proof would be, and this is just for council chambers during council meeting only, um, not, not any place else. This is just for council meetings only. Uh, Mayor and city council, let me contemplate that as to whether or not you can, um, if that would be a resolution or if that could just be something that you mayor post on our website. Um, I don't know how best to achieve that. Let me, let me think about that and I will let you know immediate, you know, as soon as possible. Um, I think that that is something that isn't required by a resolution. You may want to do that, but we're, we're kind of coming up on time here for our next meeting. So I will, I will get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, and then the last thing, and I know uh, Councillor Flores has a question, but um, so remember the emergency uh, authority that Council gave me, has, is, does that, has that now been ceased or is that still available? Oh, how does that work? And then the reason why I ask is it would be in conjunction with our Council meeting. That's why I, I wanted to know. That's why I want to know if it needs to be a resolution or proclamation. Uh, Mayor and Council, the 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 emergency proclamations that you previously approved by resolution rank, ran concurrently with the governor's. However, the ordinance does allow you to independently issue an emergency proclamation. So as long as um, there's still an ongoing pandemic, we could meet that requirement. Okay, so then we don't have to have a special meeting for that. If I, if I needed to, uh, I could issue it like on us, effective on a Sunday, good for 48 hours and then it would carry over to the Correct. council meeting. Okay, all right, thanks. Uh, Councilor Flores. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, um, Jennifer. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Mayor, when is our next uh, in-person meeting? Do you know? Do you the 19th, one o'clock. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Mayor. Did, did I see your hand go up, Councilor Bencomo, or? Yeah, Mayor, I, I guess I'll ask you, actually. I'm curious about e e making it either or, like you can show your vaccination card or mask up. Oh, you want to, you, you were the reason, you know, you requested it and I'm trying to accommodate. I think you have some very valid points, so wh whatever you prefer, I mean. Yeah, you're... I mean, I just, I, you know, for whoever can't, won't, that's none of my business. So um, you're okay with the mask? Is that what you're saying? And wear a mask. Yeah. So either prove, uh, so you, you just want verification somehow or you wear your mask? Correct. Okay. Well, that makes things a lot easier. Yeah. Okay. Great. Then, um, Jennifer, you can get back with us on, or get back with me on that. Okay. Perfect. Okay. If there's nothing further, entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Okay, motion made by Councilor Baker Stuvi. Is there a second? I'll second it, Sorg. Councilor Sorg seconds. Christine? This is on a motion to adjourn the regular meeting. Councilor Baker Stuvi? Yes. Councilor Vasquez? Yes. Councilor Bencomo? Yes. Councilor Sorg? Yes. Councilor Flores? Yes. Councilor Gandara? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Okay, we're adjourned. It's uh, 3.29 p.m. Have a good uh, rest of the uh, day, afternoon, evening. Okay, bye now. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm.